So on the first day of the free agency tampering period, the Giants made a couple of free agent signings as well as franchise tagging Leonard Williams. A couple of these moves I guess we can see coming, but I wasn't exactly sure they were going to bring in Blake Martinez. There was some rumors going on in the afternoon, but I think just an hour ago or so, maybe at 12 o'clock midnight, the Giants um, announced they are signing, well, you know, social media announced the Giants are signing Blake Martinez. They signed James Bradbury earlier in the day, $15 million per year, and Blake Martinez making $10 million per year. So right off the bat, these moves are kind of underwhelming in my mind. We had high expectations, high hopes. I mean, me, I wanted Corey Littleton. I wanted a couple other, you know, probably a few other guys that are, you know, low-key type signings that would have been good moves, but Gettleman goes out and signs Bradbury, who he drafted in Carolina, and brings in a tackling machine, Blake Martinez, who has his limitations as well. So we'll dive into these moves, talk about them. Um, Leonard Williams, we know. I mean, I honestly wish they'd rather have given him a multi-year extension for about $12, $11 million per year, but now he's franchise tagged, making $16 million dollars next year which is a lot in my mind so that's kind of disappointing but they weren't gonna you know they weren't gonna lose him obviously we knew that once the Giants made that trade it was kind of set in stone that Leonard Williams was going to be back here next year whether it was a long-term contract or via the franchise tag and they ended up having the franchise tag him so it is what it is and now we'll talk about Blake Martinez and James Bradbury. So we'll start with James Bradbury, a guy who signed for three years and $45 million, $15 million per year, basically. Dave Gettleman drafted this guy in the second round in 2016, so there's a connection there, of course. The positives, he's 26 years old. His career completion percentage against him when targeted is only 53%, which is not too bad, honestly. He did fairly well against some tough competition. I pointed out on Twitter, if you follow me, that he went against guys like Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. I didn't include Chris Godwin. But yeah, Chris Godwin, um, Julio Jones, and Michael Thomas, he went against them six times per year, basically, out of 16 games, which is very tough, and that's definitely hard for any cornerback, no matter how good you are. And Bradbury did pretty well in most of those matchups. Of course, he's had times where he's been torched by Julio, but for the most part, really held his own against some top-tier receivers on a consistent basis. He has good instincts, and that can lead to some interceptions, obviously. I think he did a good job guarding the intermediate routes when I went back and watched his 2019 tape he had some negatives we'll get into those later but the intermediate routes I think he did a good job on jumping on those and making some plays he doesn't give up. He's not going to give you a Janoris Jenkins type effort. He makes plays in the run game as well. He's not the best tackler, but at least he gives an effort, so that's all I really care about. And the good news is the Giants don't have to fully rely on DeAndre Baker to be their number one corner next year. That was going to be a lot of pressure on a, on a guy that young who struggled a lot in his rookie year, but now the Giants have an established veteran in James Bradbury. They bring him in next to DeAndre Baker. Bradbury's probably not going to play the slot. The Giants still have a slot issue, but Bring in, bringing him in next to DeAndre Baker makes his uh, job a lot easier, obviously, and can learn from a guy like James Bradbury. So the negatives, he's now like a top three to four or five highest paid cornerback in football, which, you know, when you think about the top five cornerbacks in football, the name James Bradbury is probably not going to come to mind, but he might be top ten. You could argue that, but top three, top four money for a guy like him is not what you want. But, of course, every year, basically, the salary cap goes up and the guys get paid more, so it is what it is. It's not really something that I could I could complain about too much. And PFF gave him a 61 grade in 2019. For those that care about PFF, 61 is kind of like average. It's not too great. So that's not something that's, you know, something to brag about for him. His career missed tackle rate. He had a career high last year, I should say, 11.3 uh, missed tackle percentage in 2019. So he was pretty good in 2018. In 2017, it was also like 11%. And then in 2019, it jumped up once again. So maybe... We hope he gets back to a better missed tackle percentage for next year. That's what we hope, at least. And he was not too great at defending vertical routes. I noticed a few times there was a route against A.J. Brown on a deep ball that he got beat on. Mike Evans had a deep ball against him. Julio Jones had a deep ball against him. But when you talk about guys like that, those are some very talented receivers, and you can only do so much. So there were times he was beat deep, but I think for the medium and short passes, he did pretty well. And... He doesn't fit that slot corner need. The Giants, you know, obviously have a need at slot corner right now. Maybe they address it in the draft. I have no idea. But right now, there's still not an answer at slot corner, which sucks. But, you know, he's an outside guy who's going to do a pretty good job, I think, you know, 
He's a pretty high-end number two cornerback. I don't know if I would call James Bradbury a legitimate number one corner, but I think he's a high-end number two receiver, and I do think DeAndre Baker still has that talent to be a number one. That's what we hope for next year, and hopefully you know, that happens. So if DeAndre Baker plays well and James Bradbury do, does what he does next to him, it'll make the signing look a whole lot better. So I don't want to put too much pressure on DeAndre Baker, but it's just the truth. I mean, if you count on James Bradbury to be your number one guy and cover the number one receiver every week, It might get a little rough, but I think DeAndre Baker will take that step next year and hopefully be much better than he was his rookie year. So overall, I'd probably give this signing like a B. It wasn't too bad. I mean, $15 million per year does sound like a lot, but James Bradbury is pretty solid. He's not the most flashy or exciting player. He's not the best at his position. He might not be top five in his position, although he's paid like it. But he's still a solid player and definitely a big upgrade for a position of need for the Giants. So here's the interesting one. It's Blake Martinez. A lot of mixed reviews about this one on social media. I see people that love this move. I see people that despise this move. I know Anthony and Alex, who I do the podcast with, not big fans of this move, especially Anthony. He was definitely against this. And Anthony actually sent us a video in a group chat of a YouTube video basically exposing Blake Martinez. I'll post that in the description because it's actually a good video and kind of proves that Blake Martinez might be a bit overrated. Me, myself, I was front and center of a guy who definitely thought Blake Martinez was a lot better than he actually is. I came on here like a probably a month ago, month and a half ago maybe, talking about how Blake Martinez would be a good option for this team and whatnot, but he does have his limitations. I thought he would be a lot better in uh, in pass coverage, but he honestly was not. I mean, when you went back and watched his tape, he wasn't that good, but his numbers suggested that he wasn't too bad, so it was a bit conflicting in my mind. The website I was going off of said his completion percentage against him was in like the 70s. I'll try to find that number real quick for you guys. So, so completion percentage against him his rookie year was 62.5%, which is pretty good for an inside linebacker. Then it went up to 70% his next year, then 73, and then 80, 82. So yeah, he got worse every year with pass coverage based off those numbers. And for a while, I thought he was a good, you know, inside linebacker against, um, you know, against the pass, but turns out he's getting worse in that category for some reason. So Blake Martinez, I always knew had his limitations athletically and based off his speed, but he does have some positives to him. We'll get into those first. So it was a three year, $30 million deal. There's really nothing that came out about guaranteed money yet. So that'll, that'll probably come out tomorrow or the next day. So that'll come out soon. Just keep your eyes open for it. He's 26 years old, very durable. I don't think he's missed a game since his rookie year. Plays the run very well. He does miss some tackles, but he's always there making tackles. And he's had 446 tackles since 2017, which probably leads the NFL. I'm not sure, but I would not be shocked if that led the NFL because that's a lot of tackles for a three-season span. He's probably a good locker room guy. I'm not exactly sure about that, but he's a Stanford guy, probably pretty bright and you know, probably a good locker room leader as well. He was always directing that Green Bay defense as to where to line up and stuff like that, so I'd assume he's a pretty good locker room guy and well-liked. So... He's not bad at rushing the quarterback when asked. I mean, I saw his pass rushing pressures and stuff like that. His sack percentage last year was 10.7, which is actually pretty good. So he sacked a quarterback on 10.7% of his rushes, but he only rushed a quarterback 28 times last year. And then in 2018, had five sacks on the year. So that's not terrible. When he's asked to rush the quarterback, he can make some things happen. So that's a positive about him. The negatives, though, he has been getting worse in pass coverage. I know I said on a video that he was good in pass coverage, but me not realizing that he's getting worse in pass coverage every year, not a good thing. So that's definitely a concern. I don't think he's as bad as Alec Ogletree in the pass coverage department, but he might not be good either. Obviously, I wanted Corey Littleton, who's much better at it. Even Joe Schobert's probably better at it. Of course, Isaiah Simmons would be phenomenal at it. So, you know, that's really the bad thing about the signing. He's not like the modern-day linebacker. He's more of like a 1980s type of guy where he like just plays the run really well, makes a lot of tackles. He looks good in the stat sheet, but when you watch him play, it might be a bit underwhelming. His highlights are probably very boring. I'll make his highlight tape tomorrow for you guys. I probably won't do it tonight because it's late, but I'll probably have it out tomorrow at some point. He nearly missed 10% of his tackles last year, which is not too good. You'd like to see that number probably below 5% for an inside linebacker because making tackles is probably your most important job as an inside linebacker. Of course, uh, covering tight ends and running backs is very important in you know 2020s NFL, but he's not someone that's that good at it. So this doesn't really solve the Giants' need 
as a coverage linebacker. They have Ryan Conley, who does about the same things that Blake Martinez does. Maybe a bit better, honestly. If, if Ryan Conley comes back healthy, he'll be on a much better contract, obviously, being like a fifth or fourth round pick from last year. So that'll be a lot better. But he's not the modern-day linebacker that you would want. He is limited. He doesn't have sideline to sideline athleticism or speed. So that definitely, he's not the Deion Jones, Miles Jack type, Isaiah Simmons type that we've been craving here for a while. But based off the previous linebackers we've had with Alec Ogletree, Jonathan Casillas, you know, declining John Beeson. Like, we've had some pretty bad inside linebackers here in recent years, and Blake Martinez should be an upgrade over those guys, which is why I'm not taking this news as hard as other people because, hey, I'm looking at this like this is an upgrade for the Giants, but when you have a guy like Corey Littleton sitting out there who has, still is not signed yet, which is kind of interesting. I figured he would be signed at this point, but he probably would get more money than this. I mean, even Joe Schobert, I think, would be worth it, and there's probably some players in the draft that could be better options than Blake Martinez, so that's surprising to me me and you know what it is what it is i'll see how this plays out i'm not too excited about it right now this probably would not be something i would do if i was in charge of making moves but we'll see i mean three years 30 million is probably not going to kill you but i would rather put that money elsewhere so we'll see what happens with him i'll try to see if i miss anything here 10 percent tackles missed um getting worse in coverage yes i mean you guys know the deal with blake martinez that you either love this move or you hate it I kind of I'm on the side of like I don't like it too much, but it is an upgrade over Casillas and Alec Ogletree, so I'll see how this goes. But yeah, I mean Blake Martinez would have been a phenomenal you know inside linebacker number two, but he's your number one guy here, so that might be a bit of a concern. But we'll see how the guy plays, and of course there's more moves to be made. Probably not any big moves because the Giants are you know kind of running out of money at this point. There's probably like twenty million dollars left to spend in this off season, so. I don't know if that's including the draft or not. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I don't think, you know, the Giants were going to sign a big guy like Clowney or Littleton at this point. So, of course, Byron Jones got paid already. So there's not really much out there for the Giants to go out and address, but hopefully they make a small signing like a Ted Karras, Brian Poole, Kyler Fackrell, who's a teammate of Blake Martinez, a former teammate, make a move like that. Ricky Seals-Jones, who I've been interested in, maybe they make a move like that. Of course, there's going to be some small moves out there, but I think for big-time moves, this is probably it for the Giants, and if you were to tell me it was Blake Martinez and James Bradbury, that's a bit underwhelming to me. I'm not too excited about this. I'm not too happy about it, but I'm not like totally pissed off about it either, so it's not like they gave Blake Martinez $15 you know, million dollars per year. That would definitely annoy me, but I guess $10 million or something something I can live with. He'll be solid. He'll be there every game, hopefully. He doesn't miss games. He'll make a lot of tackles. He'll look good, and hopefully he's better now. Google tree, obviously. So for Bradbury, he needs to play just a solid cornerback number two role. He might start out as a cornerback one for this team, but hopefully as DeAndre Baker gets better, you could just have him slide back to a cornerback two role and make his job a lot easier. So let me know what you guys think about this offseason so far. We're only one day in. It's Leonard Williams, James Bradbury, and Blake Martinez. I'm not too excited about it, but... I'm really underwhelmed by Gettleman moves a lot, so I'm not too surprised, but hopefully I'm wrong, and hopefully these signings pay off for the Giants, but we'll see what happens next year. So once again, let me know in the comments if you like these moves, and I'll talk to you guys next time.